that's probably why you know when I read Law of One now, it's not you know I, I don't worship it. I don't I don't worship the New Testament either. Is that um, I don't know if you're familiar with with uh, Muji, but uh, you know you know I I had really coming through a Church of Christ, the idea of meditating was evil. I guess I mean I you know it was frowned upon. <laughs> But um, the first time that, that, that I was ever really able to break free of self, space, and time in any real way, um, that organic experience became real to me. And, uh, and, and, and that's why I say that word, you know, words, words to me can be useful pointers. Right. But but outside of that organic knowing from that celestial place that uh in my opinion now it, it, i don't even know if it can be explained with words like you said it's, it's hard it's, it's prob probably impossible in duality in any way shape or form to get it. Well, yeah, because I, it's, you know, I see it and I'm sure it, Ken would agree with it too. It's, it's divine experiential knowledge that it can only be experienced. And when it gets to that place, then there truly isn't words to be because it's right. a state of being. Well, it's completely knowing what, what duality is. It's only, duality is purpose to render it clear. Right. So you know what center standing is. Right. And that's consciousness as celestial law, because celestial yeah. law has a destination. We call consciousness as seeing both as an One. opportunity to become it. Right. It simply is a distance from it and then through the experience. So you know the experience of duality intimately by building its intention. Yeah. That is oneness. And again, the beauty of that for, you know, people that aren't knowing this is Orita starts with the Aleph and the Aleph does right, right. one. And so an or is light. Yep. So one light, celestial law of one light, the mystery of the many who are one. And it's it's beautiful because it starts with an Aleph and it ends with an Aleph. I mean, right. really. <laughs> well, but, even, you know? but even the or, Aleph of Rech. Yeah. One who is expanded or fully revealed in sovereignty is fully arisen as one. As a raised head. As a raised head. Yeah. That that's it. That's yeah. the Eastern man of, of Kadma. Yeah. It's 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 beautiful when you when you can connect to it in the heart. Okay, Have a good day. Thank you. Take care. So what I was saying is that when that Vav connects, when that pierces you on the inside and begins to expand your life. When it begins to expand the light in you, that allows you, I think, to be able to have even greater celestial experiences. Right. So, so, so our, our, you know, for those of us who are attempting to point, teach, I hate the word teach, but those of us who are attempting to point the way to this realization, this awareness, um, we have this unique friction placed before us every day. Is that that you know how how do we walk amongst those ex experiencing Nimosa as their only view of the Father? Right. Who, 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 who many of them are telling us, I'm trying to get somewhere that I'm trying to, I'm trying to ascend. I'm trying to climb a ladder spiritually, vibrationally, all these things. When, if they would just be still. I know. And that's why you were bringing up Muji and meditation. Right. Exactly. Because be that's, aware. Yeah. That's when that's when you give opportunity to be truly touched from the divine. You know, I used to call like when I would enter into worship, um, my husband and I used to um, before church service. So this is when we were in the Christian church before we even got into 
uh, we into uh, the sacred languages. We were in a non-denominational church that was actually it was affiliated with Bethel Church with Bill Johnson and, right. and that kind of thing. And so and there was a connection with Mike Bickle and the International House of Prayer. But this is years ago. I mean, we're talking. I know. Yeah, I know. We've we've all been down those roads. But we would in the morning before service would start was we would do what we called pre-service prayer and worship. And so, you know, Ken had a, uh, and has a gift to be able to feel spirit through music, you know, and start listening. And, and when you fine tune into that place right here, you, you know, when it's, when it's connecting to d the divine and when it is not, <laughs> you know, and so he would set this atmosphere for us to enter in to the place of the spirit that was just so beautiful. And we get it in a place where, you know, you're like praise and worship and you're ecstatic and you're having a good time and then begin to draw it in and draw it in and draw it in and draw it in until that you until you got into the place of what I called soaking. And I know many people have said that before, where the presence of the divine was so strong and so beautiful in its presence and an expression that all you could do is just sit and bask and bathe in it and allow it to enter into you to be able to touch that place of surrender and be totally okay with it and feel it envelop you and wrap you up um, like a mother's warm hug on a chilly morning or a soothing moment because you scraped your knee and you need that comfort and just squeeze you. And so in that place, when you, when you tap into that, whether it's through worship, whether it's through soaking or whether it's in meditation, everything changes. And you're right, they, they're looking for something and they're searching for it, but they're never gonna find it unless they enter into that stillness area in that place of surrender. They, it's not and, possible. And I would say that, that even in that place, you, you know, if you want a, a, a beautiful description of it, of every knee bowing and every tongue confessing, yeah. Uh, for, for me, all of my senses, and this is going to lead maybe us in this direction, all, all of my senses give up. Right. They just say, oh, we're out. That's I, right. I was here, we're out. That's right. They, they bow. Yeah. And, and so I, you know, I've been writing music since I was seven years old. I'm not, not just words, music. I've been since in poetry and I was accused that when I was seven years old, my teacher accused me of plagiarism. Wow. I, wrote a, I wrote a poem about the civil war called brother against brother. Wow. And they were like, there is no way a seven year old wrote this. And in, in a teacher parent teacher conference of the principal, I said out loud, I did write that. I just wrote it down. So when it comes from a place of past experience, it can flow out. And really at seven years old, you still were an open channel. Well, but here's the cool part about that. I, I stuttered horribly as a child. I mean, I was the biggest introvert. I never left my room. Both my parents were chain smoking alcoholics back before mental health was a thing and they were self-medicating. I get it. They did the best they could. <laughs> But I spent a lot of time alone uh, with Papa. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know what I was doing. I just that was home, and um, and I heard things and I wrote them down, and that became. So when I when I when I read Jesus's conversation with the woman at the well, I get it. When when he says to her. My father seeks those who worship the spiritual realm as reality, not in truth and spirit, as it says in English. <laughs> Even in right. Greek, it doesn't say that. Right. My father seeks those who worship in the spiritual realm as reality. I get it. I, I get it. Can't yeah. explain it. I no. get it. I can, you know, Dale Allen Hoffman says all the time that the hardest word to translate into English is word, is milta. Right. And I get that too. So just quickly, I stuttered. I missed a lot of school. 
I was a really, really smart kid. I have an IQ of over 160, but I hated school for a lot of good, a lot of good reasons. My teachers were jerks, calling on me to read. It was, it was ugly in the 70s <laughs> in elementary school and middle school. Um, and when I was a senior, I was up late one night watching the Nashville Network, and that's back when they played music on TNN. And I was watching the Ralph Emery show late at night, and they had on um, Mel Tillis, all of you youngsters will have no clue who I'm talking about. Mm -mm. He's a Hall of Fame country music writer, musician that stutters. Mm -hmm. And that was the first other human being that I ever saw stutter. And I was transfixed. I was like, wow, there's another one. <laughs> like, you know. And then he said something. Ralph said, Mel, why would, with your stuttering, why would you? get up on stage in front of people for a living. And he said, Ralph, I discovered that I don't stutter when I sing. That's right. I am so lit up right now, it's crazy. So am I. Uh, and in that moment, my whole life changed. Yeah. I went to school on Monday and <clears> I <throat> prayed that they would call on me to read. Yeah. And when they did, I sang it. And I got sent to the principal's office and I smiled all the way down there. And I said, you know what, y'all? I, I win. Sorry. And that's when, that's when everything changed. The honky-tonking country music songwriter guy got born. People <laughs> tell me they don't believe in reincarnation. I say, sit down, let me tell you my life story. That's <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> And, and, and a new one got born right there. Yeah. <clears throat> that was Oretta. Yes. Who had me as a, as a child getting me ready for that moment. Yeah.